15. Remembering that Oxford winter. A senior in any college, January of his or her final year, is always a much welcomed month. It is not simply that you can tell that there is light at the end of the tunnel. You can also predict the timing of the light beam that will signal that it is all over. But January in Oxford is also the depth of winter and all sorts of things can happen. This, my last winter at Miami University, was to be characterized by three significant changes in my living conditions. The first one was that I could not wait to get Michael, my best friend, to move into the apartment with me. We had grown closer than any other two individuals over the last term. I first met Michael in my sophomore year at a basketball game, a Miami home game. At first, I thought that he was on the basketball team as I was on the track and field team. That was because of his height. As we got to talking, I was informed that it was football that he played in high school and not basketball. But he did not make the cut for the Miami Red Hawks. They used to be called the Miami Redskins until a nicknamed selection committee chose the name Red Hawks. Yes, they actually had a nickname committee for this. Other names in the running were Thunderhawks and Miamis. Board of Trustee made its choice at a meeting on April 19, 1997. We soon started looking out for each other, and I think it was from Michael that I first started to realize that my true enterprise at Miami University was not varsity sports, but academics. He was a business and economics major, while I trended towards history and English literature. Once Michael moved off campus, our time for sharing ideas and companionship was reduced to the times between classes. So it was an accomplishment for us to finally be living under one roof and sharing a mutual friendship for more than a few hours per day. There is one thing that intervened on this happy state of affairs. We both had girlfriends who demanded more of our time. The ladies wanted to spend more time with us at the apartment than we really wanted them to. We both thought that they were quietly trying to safeguard their investments against any unwelcome encroachments. Anyway, Michael and I had decided to bring some order to this situation by designating that only on the weekends were we open for ladies to have an overnight stay. Most of the time we spent together discussing some of the events that had shaped us here at Miami. One evening after dinner, the debate became very contentious. It was about who had enjoyed more privilege in this all-white environment. I thought that Michael was totally off base in suggesting that I was fortunate to have lived most of my Miami years with more privileges than constraints. He thought that being a champion on the track and field team made me so well known among the student population that it was easy for me to draw attention both to myself and to whatever I wished for. For instance, he would recall a few instances when some of the female students would approach us, that is both he and myself. Invariably, they would know my name and embarrassingly ask what was his. This really surprised me. I argued vehemently that I was the one who ended up sleeping on the streets in Oxford. So where were the privileges then? That is the first time I ever heard Michael tell me that I was making too much out of six days of homelessness. Just look what it got you, bro. You got a dad, a place to live, scholarships to get you back into school and even a cute medical doctor who wanted to fall in love with you. 
Don't let us go there, Michael, I protested. Bro, except for that brief period in your life, you moved from the privileges associated with a popular jock to those associated with being the son of a distinguished faculty member, driving a European car around the place and having a local girlfriend. I started to think about it. As he had said, I had spent less than 1% of my days at Miami as homeless, but that seemed to be all that I would like to be remembered for. I immediately started to rewrite my valedictorian speech. No more wailing and lamentations. I would speak of the fortunes that came my way and why they did. But then, there was one thing that represented hope for me in this world of despair. It was being a member of a subgroup that had the distinguishing feature of being black. It wasn't that I only enjoyed myself at this school when I was with other black students. I think it was that I learned more about myself when I was among the other black students. It was winter in Ohio, and regardless of whether it was I coming from the inner city of Dayton, Ohio, or Michael, the son of a Navy Vice Admiral in South Carolina, we were both in for a weather shock we would not ever forget. I say this because it was the weather that made the second imprint on our mind in these last of my college days. Ohio is no stranger to inclement weather. Snowfall, freezing rain, sleet are all part of the Buckeye State's winter experience. Those of us living in Ohio knew to expect windy, snowy, and cold winters. Even so, there have been some storms throughout Ohio's history that won't be forgotten anytime soon. Oxford being situated in the southwest corner of the state was not a place for notable snowstorms, but this year, winter had chosen to be exceptional. Oxford would usually take on the look of a fairy tale land during a heavy snowfall. When the snow is soft and wet, it covers all the buildings, streets, cars, everything place looks like a village of icy cottages with dinky icicles and plaster snow. If you wanted to reshoot the winter scenes in the movie Dr. Chivago, this would be one of the best alternatives. However, when it gets really bad, and it seldom does, the place turns into a Midwestern site. It was on a Wednesday in the second week of February when the winds quickly increased with gusts of 30 to 40 miles per hour at times throughout the day. This was mixed with rain that quickly turned into ice and then to heavy snow. This considerable blowing and drifting had made the road conditions very treacherous. By the next day, Thursday, Travel was nearly impossible, with many vehicles stuck on the interstates and flights in and out of Ohio's major airports being cancelled. The snowstorm lasted for four days, paralyzing the entire town of Oxford. It was a half to three quarter inches of ice accretion, leading to dozens of downed trees and power lines. Our outages lasted over the entire weekend into the following week, and citizens were being cautioned to shelter in place. Soon it was realized that there were families who were running low on food supplies. I called Gwen to find out how they were coping. She mentioned that her dad was becoming irritable because they were running out of bread and milk. He was so addicted to his breakfast meal. Emergency crews were starting to be organized, and to our surprise, there appeared some motorized sleds 
that began hauling supplies to the student dorm. They were backcountry sleds, and we had no idea where they came from. Our neighbor in the apartment complex was in charge of the Oxford Fire Department. Actually, he was the fire chief's assistant and office manager. You'd remember that where I was living was not student housing, but apartments for grown-ups in the professional workforce. The Oxford Fire Department members usually worked 12-hour shifts from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. They had 11 full-time staff members and over 40 part-time and volunteer firefighters, as well as emergency medical technicians, EMTs. Volunteers were still very important to the fire department's operation, and as a consequence, our neighbor came over and asked if we would be willing to assist. I thought this was a great idea, more so because he wanted us to organize getting supplies into the black area of the town, which was totally cut off. To get there, we had to use skis. For the first time in my life, I was skiing in some parts of town with a backpack full of supplies. Both Michael and I caught on to this skill very easily because it required more muscle power than maneuverability. Most of the area was relatively flat. Suddenly, I got a flash of imagination, secured a small hamp of bread, cheese, and milk, and asked Michael if he would come with me up to Gwen's home. You should have seen their faces when we rang the front doorbell. Someone had cleared a small veranda outside of the front door, and there was Gwen looking through the glass winter storm door. I had to take off most of my head covering for her to recognize her both. She started to shout, Mom, it is Eric and Michael. We couldn't stay. I gave her the hamper and said, This is for your dad. Just tell him to sit tight and keep the feet. After that successful Save the Dad mission, Michael would always say, You won, bro. You did it. Now you're going to have to marry her. I was later told that Gwen's dad reaffirmed to his wife the belief that the only thing that would save them in an emergency was if they got some black guys on that fire emergency team. We volunteered for only two days before the village council started to make meaningful progress in clearing the roads and supplies started to move more freely. Winter settled down a bit, but Oxford still saw very low temperatures and some more snow. This would turn out to be the worst winter since the pandemic of 2020. We had another snowstorm in March, but this time everyone was more prepared. We had both ladies sleeping over that weekend, so both Michael and myself just cozied it up with our better halves that small night. At about 12 midnight, my phone rang. It startled me, and as I looked at the caller ID, it was Michael. Why was Michael Coghill calling me at this time of the night? It also awakened Gwen who was sleeping beside me. I stepped out of the bedroom and answered, Yes, Michael, why are you calling me at this hour of the night? Big brother, please forgive me. You're the only one I could talk to. What happened now? I just came back from the coach's house. What were you doing there? Having sex with him. Are you crazy, Michael? Where was his wife? Isn't he still married? Well, that is the problem. I don't know, but there has to be some correlation between one's ability to comprehend a story being told and the time of the day. And this time was not my best time to understand Michael's wailing. As I was made to understand what he said above his mumble and tears, it was snowing heavily and he was feeling very lonely. Being aimless in thought, he answered an unexpected call from the assistant coach. 
he too had been feeling the urge for sex as he made the pitch to ask Michael over for dinner. At first, all of this sounded crazy, but then the coach assured Michael that his wife had left for Miami, Florida for the weekend. Fortunate for her and also fortunate for him. Without thinking, Michael accepted the offer and soon the coach was on his way to pick him up. I knew I shouldn't have gone, but anyway I went. We had a nice dinner, then one thing led to another, and next he was insisting we make love. Then he froze, as if in the middle of a sentence which was struggling to come out, and started to cry again. I penetrated him. I shouldn't say it, but my reaction probably was as cold as the nightlife outside. So why are you telling me all this shit? I was starting to get angry. Please, big brother, don't get angry with me. Who else could I tell? He continued. What was even more scary was that when we had stopped, I realized that I was in deep shit again. I decided to leave right away. He tried stopping me by saying that he didn't feel like driving me back to the dorm in all that snow. I just called an Uber and got myself home. That was about 11 p.m. And then just now, he texted me to say that someone rang his doorbell at about 11.30 and he thought it was me and that I may have had a change of mind. When he opened the door, it was his wife. It was like she had set a trap for him. While thanking me for the wisdom to leave early, he tells me that I had left my t-shirt in the guest bathroom after my shower. She found it and started to ask him questions. How she knows it was you, the coach confessed. Bro, I don't know what to do. What do I do? Michael, just listen to me carefully. You have to transfer from that school this year. You just get on your admission drive and find a school that will take you. Any school. By this time, I was shouting into the phone. You cannot stay at Oberlin College. Yes, but I cannot get an athletic scholarship again if my coach does not recommend me. And with this shit coming down, that is going to be the last thing that the senior coach will be willing to do. Just get admission to another school. We'll talk about how you are going to pay for it later on. I hung up on Michael. There was nothing left for me to say. When asked, who was that? I told her that it was Michael. Of course, she wanted to know why was he calling me at this time of the night. I just came out bluntly and said, he just had sex with his junior coach and is now regretting it. What? She was totally confused. She had not known about that side of Michael. So what did you tell him? What else could I tell him, Gwen? Transfer to another school as soon as he can and that I was going back to sleep. And so I did.